Hey KVC youth, uh, welcome to our segment dedicated to our theme this fall, which is Stories Matter. This semester we're going to be exploring the stories of church members here at Kirkwood Baptist Church and how their stories can inspire and help us connect with others in the world. So our first guest this fall is Susan Slaughter. Susan Slaughter joined the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra in 1969 and four years later became the first woman to be named Principal Trumpet of a major symphony orchestra. A graduate of Indian University, she received the coveted Performer cer Certificate in Recognition of Outstanding mus Musical Performance. And she studied under uh, many different uh, people in the music industry that I can't pronounce, like Hubert Mueller and Bernard Edistein and Arnold Jacobs and Robert and all sure. many, many more. So yes, as it goes on more and more. But Susan has been a part of our church. She um, also is a part of the KBC Brass and um, is connected in many different ways. So for some of uh, our youth, though, Susan, um, they may not be familiar with you. What brought you to Kirkwood Baptist Church and how long have you been a member here? Well, I'm not exactly uh, on the years. Uh, I think I've been about 12 or 13 years. Been a okay. Member. I joined when Scott Stearman had been here. Okay. Uh, Allison Felter told us about Kirkwood Baptist Church, and we came, I visited, and uh, liked, liked it, felt very welcome, and I think it's important to remember that when there are new people in the, in the church, even if you don't know they're a member, it's okay to say hi to them. <laughs> you don't have to have a long conversation. Just say hi, nice to see you, hope you come back again. Oh, you're a member? good oh and yeah that's <laughs> all right you know we all make mistakes but that's okay yeah Allison Felter is the reason I started coming to Baptist uh, Kirkwood Baptist Church to, to visit one thing that I'm going to ask all of our guests in uh, this semester is about their childhood and if religion played a role in it so um, briefly can you tell me about what role religion played in your life when you were growing up it played a huge role part of my life. First off, I grew up on a farm, and if you uh, can think about it, uh, farmers are a little isolated in a sense, um, and so the church is about five miles away. It was the Church of the Nazarene. Okay. My father was a Sunday school teacher. Both my mother and father were members of the board, and my mother was the treasurer. Okay. I sang in the youth choir. My Sunday school teacher in my teen years was highly important. Okay. took every one of us under her wing, and I don't know how she did that now as I look back, but none of us felt slighted in terms of her love and just had parties at her house all the time and brought us together. Our youth choir was the same way. We even made a record. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go, early recording. <laughs> when I would play in church, the people would be very supportive. Wow. And whether I thought I played well or not, they always thought it was a blessing. So uh, I, I really come from a strong background, mm -hmm. but of course I had to make the decision to accept the Lord into my life. Yeah. And to uh, go that way. Now, obviously, I'm not a Nazarene anymore. I've come to Kirkwood Baptist Church and feel that that's where the Lord wants me. That's awesome. So. <laughs> With the theme of Stories Matter, one, one story that I wanted to focus on, and I know you've probably talked about uh, before in your life, is about you becoming the first woman to be named principal trumpet of any major symphony orchestra. I believe that's correct, right? Yes, and that's, that's actually that's true. In 1973, when I became principal, yeah. that was the true of the whole world. Wow, okay. So... <laughs> First of all, uh, maybe real quickly you can tell us what a principal trumpet uh, in, a, in an orchestra is. And two, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about, did your faith have any influence on how you navigated that world of the symphony and how you carried yourself as a leader? Okay. I, I want to go back just a little bit. When I got ready to go to school, Indiana University, uh, I really wanted to go to Olivet Nazarene College. That's where all my friends were going in church. And my parents, I'm certain, consulted with music teachers and said, what do you think? And they said, oh, you should send her to IU. So they kind of negotiated with me and said, 
uh, we'd like you to go to IU at least for one year, and if you don't think that's where the Lord wants you, then you can transfer to Olivet. So I got down there, and it just seemed like that's where the Lord wanted me. Yeah. Uh, my first lesson with my teacher, he had never heard me play, and keep in mind, under home form, I'm very shy. Okay. okay. Very shy. And he said, well, I see you've signed up for a, a performance degree here. Now, I li I'd like to recommend you sign up for education. And I said, Mr. Buell, um, you haven't heard me play. Uh, could you, uh, could we just wait a semester? And if at the end of the semester you feel like I need to sign up for education, uh, I'll do it. I'll do that. And he never followed up again. Oh, so wow. now, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but uh, there I was, uh, and that was where the Lord wanted me. When at, at the end of my education, I, in a, applying for a job, you have to audition, you have to play for your meal, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, in those days, there were no curtains. So you walk on the stage, they can see what race you are, what gender you are, what shoes you're wearing. Oh you my know. gosh, wow, yeah. So uh, I sent out about 30 letters, and uh, let me just share this. There are 15 out of those 30, 15 orchestras that pay a living wage. Okay. It means it'd be enough for me to sustain myself, maybe buy a little house. As you get into the higher echelon orchestras, uh, St. Louis, Chicago, etc., the salary goes up considerably. Okay. So I did not receive any invitation from those orchestras, but I did from three, shall we say, minor league orchestras. So non-living wage orchestras, right? Well, three thousand dollars a year. Wow, is that? <laughs> that was my wage. Wow. I was first trumpet, principal trumpet in the Toledo Symphony for two years. Okay. And then I applied. Uh, there was an opening here in St. Louis, fourth trumpet. So I applied for that, and uh, audition again. There were no screens, and they called me to hire me. And I said, Oh, okay. Let me get back to you because I was playing first trumpet in Toledo for three thousand. Uh huh. They were offering me $9,000 to move to St. Louis wow. and play fourth trumpet, okay? So I called my teacher, and I'm certain he said, uh, picked up the phone, but he said, Susan, take the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like that's where I should come. So when I got here, I was in the lower part of the section, which was good. It was good for me to see how a section should run. Then our principal trumpet resigned, went to Europe. And uh, we held auditions, and I was chosen to be the principal. So, in a sense, by being in the lower power section, I knew how I would like to be treated. Yeah. And when I became the principal, I felt like I knew how I how I should be treated in the section. Wow. So, uh, I was uh, named in 1973, and I was there 40 years. That's awesome. Now, part of of what happened after I'd been playing for about 20 years there I was noticed that in the other existing brass conferences one's called the International Trumpet Guild okay. one's the Trombone Association etc they would never feature any women artists mm. and more and more women that I was becoming acquainted with were very 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 good players and deserved to have an opportunity so I got to thinking about this and uh, sent out a survey, like a fleece. Yeah. The judges, was it, or Gideon put out a fleece? Well, I put out a fleece with the survey, and the survey said, do you think we should establish a women's brass conference? Mm -hmm. And the answer came back, yes. I sent out about 1,500 letters, surveys, and 500 of those came back. Wow. Three to five percent is a like very good return. This was thirty percent. Wow! So I have to pay. And from that came the, the question, how am I going to raise money? So that's when I started the holiday brass concerts. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, that's the, so. so you, the holiday brass concerts were a way to raise money for this women's conference Internet. because. Yeah, Internet. Women's brass conference. Because at the time, women weren't being featured or weren't being brought into the the other conferences where it was predominantly dominated by men. Right. Yeah. And to be honest with you, when I called the other conferences, I told them, 
what I'm thinking of doing, and a couple of them said, oh, that's a wonderful idea, and a few of them were kind of angry with me for wow. telling, doing that. So, uh, it's just, if you do the right thing, it's not going to please everyone. That's yeah. one of the things you need to remember. But doing the right thing is the right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and a way to say it. Wow. You can, you can live with yourself if you do the right thing. If you go against what you know to be right, it's doesn't work out yeah. in my heart. And finally, Susan, uh, for this, uh, for our youth group watching and um, and listening to your story, uh, what's what's at least one thing that you would like to share or a takeaway for the youth group about your faith and your journey throughout your life? I think one of the hardest things is gaining confidence that God created you to be the person you are. Oh, yeah. And for instance, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we all read that and think about how we're supposed to treat other people. But about uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh-huh. Uh, you all can look up where that's found. Um, I accepted God's love. But I, and I believe God loved me, mm -hmm. but I didn't really love myself. Mm. So until I accepted myself and realized that I should love myself the way God loves me. Yeah. In other words, take 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and say, Susan, you be kind to Susan, or use your own name. Ah. Then by applying it that way, I began to learn that until I could love myself, I really couldn't love me mm. and accept you because it didn't accept myself. So I, that's, that's, I think, one of the most important things. That's, that's beautiful. And I think that's a huge, especially for, you know, for kids going through middle school and high school, trying to figure out who you are and being able to accept and love yourself for who you are, period, is, uh, is a very encouraging and, and a message always to be remembered. So that's great. Yeah, thank you. But don't worry if you don't feel like you fit in. Hmm. Because you fit in with God. Yeah. Wow. Well, Susan, I, I cannot thank you enough for your time and for sharing your story. This has been great. And uh, um, thank you once again for uh, speaking with us and sharing your story. My pleasure.